I'm an associate professor of history at Millersville University of Pennsylvania, and I'm director of a conference on Holocaust and genocide. I'm Kievan in fifth generation. My ancestors live in Kiev still in late 19th, beginning of 20th century, and um, I always have a great interest to history of Kiev as well as history of Jews in Kiev. This is why I choose to write a book on history of Jews in Kiev in late 19th, uh, beginning of 20th century, where the vast majority of material. But then I also look um, on the origins of this history, and it turned me to the 10th century of, uh, of course, common era. And um, uh, I include in my book all available materials on history of Jews in Kiev uh, from 10th century to um, February Revolution 1917. First Jews arrived to Kiev uh, from Kazarian Kaganate. This was a medieval state in the mouth of Volga River, uh, and uh, Jews were merchants there. They travel uh, for um, commercial affairs basically around the world. And some Jews probably found um, Kiev very uh, beautiful uh, medieval town and decided to settle there. Probably there were good um, possibility for commerce. However, we don't know details. We just know from a um, document of 10th century that calls Kievan Letter that Jews in 10th century already lived in Kiev. Actually, this letter of uh, 10th century said that some uh, Jew become in trouble because um, uh, he was guarant uh, guarantor for somebody else. He um, uh, promised uh, that if a person cannot uh, pay money back, that he will pay for him debt. And um, then this uh, person uh, was uh, robbed, uh, lost all uh, property, and this person uh, have to pay debt for him. Uh, so it was a problem. Uh, but uh, what we know that a letter listed a uh, name of some merchants. Um, we know from other documents a little bit later, about 12th century of common era, that Jews uh, live in palace um, or near palace uh, of uh, Prince of Kievan Rus. And um, they, uh, um, uh, again, uh, were involved uh, in commercial affairs. I can tell you that in pre-industrial societies, Jews did not have many uh, choices for their businesses, either artisans or merchants, because Christian countries at those time did not allow Jews to purchase land. If uh, agricultural societies, pre-industrial societies, you cannot buy land, you can be either artisan or a merchant, uh, there's uh, two other professions, because industry still did not exist. Uh, they could not own the land. Uh, regarding uh, rent land, they sometimes were um, not in Kiev, but in rural area. Managers uh, in uh, noble um, estates, uh, so they, uh, uh, we can say, collected taxes, uh, tax collectors, uh, uh, in Kiev, also some Jews uh, later, about the 17th century, so documents uh, were tax collectors. Uh, so uh, many Jews were artisans, many Jews were merchants. Uh, I originally researched documents in Kiev archives, in Kiev 11 archives that contain documents on history of Jews in Kiev. Uh, this archive have government documents uh, mostly. Uh, and um, these documents can provide you important statistics. They can also provide for you other uh, important um, uh, data, but they rather dry uh, and um, to make book more entertaining, more interesting. I also use um, memoirs. I um, use um, also some oral history, basically all kinds of sources. I use uh, pictures of Kiev itself because Jews really love the city. 
city not always was friendly to Jews, uh, especially city authorities. Uh, because uh, it, in different uh, historical time were different authorities, uh, but in my period of time that I described, it uh, was um, Kievan Rus, then uh, it was uh, Kiev under power of um, Polish Lithuanian state, and then under Russian Empire. So uh, many of them, for um, religious reason, uh, were quite intolerant to Jews, and later uh, to this add uh, anti-Semitism, uh, including, of course, state anti-Semitism of authorities in Imperial Russia. Uh, but Jews always loved Kiev, and they did a lot uh, to make the city more beautiful. For example, a picture that I provide, the Bessarabsky market that was built on money that uh, left uh, to city Brodsky. Uh, it was sugar magnate um, who produced um, uh, with, uh, in uh, other businessmen, uh, Tereshchenko, who was Ukrainian businessman and industrialist, and also uh, Paul Jarazinsky uh, about a quarter of sugar in all Russian empire. So uh, Brodsky was an extremely wealthy person. He left uh, money to build Bessarabsky market. And before, during his lifetime, uh, he built, uh, provide money, uh, significant amount of money to build Polytechnical uh, Institute in Kiev. Also, he provides money to build Jewish hospital. Uh, all these uh, pictures uh, you can see in my book. Of course, not only Brodsky family. Brodsky was the wealthiest Jewish family in Kiev, Jewish kings. They were actually quite generous uh, for uh, Jewish community, and they provide charity for all population of Kiev. But there were also Margolin family, uh, also, wealthy family, uh, David Margolin uh, was owner of company, shipping company on the river Dnieper. Uh, he had many ships. And uh, he also was um, a very uh, uh, generous uh, person who gave lots of money for uh, in, uh, many different improvements in Kiev. For example, in Kiev in 1913 was all Russian uh, exhibit. Uh, so, um, uh, you know that if, uh, at this time already exists world exhibits uh, where people provide uh, the latest achievement in uh, industry and agriculture. And um, uh, same exhibit, but uh, just for all Russian Empire was in 1913 organized in Kiev. So, uh, Brodsky, Margolin, all wealthy Jewish family provide lots of money for construction of their pavilions. And Margolin, who at this time also owned tram company, provide trams for this exhibit. So, what is interesting is that he had personal tram. And now people have personal cars, but he traveled in Kiev and he's personally a luxurious uh, tram. His uh, son actually became a famous lawyer. Uh, he participated in Bailey's affair. It was a ritual trial in Kiev. I will talk about this a little bit later. And later uh, he became uh, vice minister of uh, foreign affairs in Ukrainian People, uh, People's Republic. I wrote article about Arnold Margolin also. They uh, were good Stadlands. Uh, Stadlands are mediators between a community, Jewish community, and uh, authorities. And uh, often um, Brodsky, uh, he was officially leader, um, chairman of Jewish community, have to bribe authorities to prevent uh, expulsion Jews from Kiev. Bribe was a Russian constitution, how wrote the Jewish historian Gessen. Without bribe, uh, Jews would not be allowed uh, to be there at all. So uh, the bribe um, uh, was used often, and it only uh, was a way to prevent expulsion or um, achieve uh, some other purposes that needed community. For example, um, uh, in the 1880s and then in uh, early 1900s, authorities plan expulsion of large uh, number of Jewish artisans from Kiev. 
And then uh, Brodsky purchased uh, from uh, some local uh, governor uh, some uh, plants that did not give any profit. Uh, that uh, was not a really financially good deal for him. But uh, the condition of this purchase was that Jews uh, would be allowed to continue to stay in Kiev. And, uh, I mean, uh, local authorities made uh, good money uh, on Jews. And uh, especially um, police that uh, make a night roundup on Jews and often broke uh, at night to private uh, Jewish houses uh, searching for illegal Jews. Um, the uh, places, uh, I mean, positions of um, policemen in uh, Padol, Padol was Jewish uh, district of the city, were allowed to leave uh, poor Jews, uh, was considered very profitable. And policemen that were appointed on this position in a few years become quite rich. So they like to serve there because it's no risk to their life if they're illegal Jews, they would kill them. Uh, I mean, Jews would not fight with them, but uh, to allow them to stay in Kiev, they can uh, receive good bribes for this. Kiev always was attractive uh, for Jews. Uh, they were expelled many times. They were expelled in Kiev and Russia. They were expelled um, uh, in 17th century during Kazakh's war. They were expelled um, several times by Russian rulers. Uh, but they always came back uh, because it was only a large city in region. And Kiev uh, had a reputation as uh, a merchant city, a city where uh, possible easy to make money. So uh, Shalom Aleichem wrote uh, that uh, we thought that in Kiev possible make money from snow. <laughs> it's so easy to make money in the city. Uh, of course, not everybody succeeds uh, because in Kiev uh, alone with wealthy Jews, 20% of uh, Kiev and Jewish population lived in poverty. But this reputation really attract many Jews in city. Other attractive point uh, were uh, that it was beautiful city in much better living conditions that were in small towns, uh, shtetls. For example, in the beginning of 20th century, in Kiev already was electricity, uh, running water at houses, uh, asphalt on the roads, and um, in small towns, villages, uh, of course, all this... Uh, modern conditions of living were absent. And also, many uh, Jewish uh, young people um, dream to receive good education. And uh, good gymnasiums, universities also existed in Kiev and did not exist in small provincial towns. So people come there for many reasons, uh, education reasons, uh, just because it was beautiful city with modern living conditions, and also some people who won't make money come to make money. Uh, actually, Shalom Aleichem was uh, one of them. He, before become famous author, um, tried uh, to play on stock market. And he lost not only all his money, but uh, also uh, he come in big debt and uh, was in big trouble for several years. And uh, he even after this cannot stay in Kiev because he hid from his creditors. But then he became famous author uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, uh, was able to live in Kiev. Russian authorities always called pogrom people revenge. People revenge to Jews for their harmful activities. But uh, authorities really often inspired this revenge, uh, in quotation mark, we can put revenge, or even uh, provoke it, as it was uh, during pogroms of 1905. Uh, what really happened in the period of first Russian Revolution, to uh, revert anger of people from authorities, they need to find scapegoats, uh, blame somebody uh, why people live so poor. And they uh, claim that it's all Jewish exploitation and uh, Jewish uh, people troublemakers, they revolutionaries, uh, they break the order. And uh, they uh, strictly hinted that who will participate in pogrom would not receive any punishment. More than this, um, to many um, 
Jewish apartments, uh, police brought uh, pogrom crowd. Instead, defend Jewish uh, apartments and houses. Police brought their point out on this uh, apartment and houses to pogrom makers. Um, I saw a document and archive. It uh, complained of David Margolin that uh, to apartment of his son, Arnold Margolin, policemen uh, brought a pogrom crowd and policemen first start to break uh, property in this uh, house. So, uh, police not only did not protect Jews, police actually uh, participate in pogroms, as well as troops uh, often participate in pogroms and uh, stole Jewish property. Some people, uh, especially criminals, look at this as a way to enrich themselves, that you can uh, break to the house, take everything that you want, and no punishment for this. There are many stereotypes, but in life, uh, everything was much more complicated, and you cannot paint everything by black and white colors, uh, because uh, there are many different shades. Uh, There uh, exists everything. Exists anti-Semitism, exists prejudice, but exist also good relations and cooperation between Jewish community and um, Ukrainian community. For example, uh, one of my um, distant relatives uh, came to Kiev in the beginning of 20th century from a small town, just uh, 50 kilometers or 30 miles from Kiev, name of town, Shibino. It basically shtetl or village where live 5,000 people. And um, uh, I heard his uh, oral uh, history he interview with him that recorded his daughter and granddaughter. And uh, his daughter asked him, uh, whether um, you immigrate because of anti-Semitism, uh, did you move to Kiev also because of anti-Semitism, because local peasants were Semites? And he said, no, peasants have very good relation to our family. And he she asked, uh, uh, they were actually, he said, very friendly. And she asked him, friendly anti-Semites? She was so surprised, astonished. And uh, he said, we had a store and we sell everything to peasants in credit because they never have money in uh, winter and spring. They just had money when they uh, sell their harvest, but usually this money run out by winter and spring. So we sell them everything in credit and they pay it us later when they get money from next um, harvest. More than this... Um, uh, this, um, my relative, uh, his name um, uh, was Fedorovsky when he immigrated to, uh, he was Moisha Fedorovsky when he immigrated to America, he became Morris Feder. Uh, he said that in the village they can live only because they have land, they had horses, uh, but uh, she asked him, how you can have land? Uh, Russian government did not allow Jews to have land. And he said, it was uh, written on name of some Ukrainian peasant for whom we paid also some money that he take it on his name. Uh, so, only this cooperation between uh, local population and Jews helped Jews to survive in uh, conditions of Russian empire exist over 300 different laws that banned for Jews live in rural area, banned to Jews live outside of pale of settlement, banned Jews uh, take state position, banned uh, Jews to take place in universities over 5% of all students. So only cooperation uh, with local population and bribes allowed Jews uh, to survive in these conditions, uh, because otherwise uh, we can say that the environment would be too hostile for them to survive at all. Uh, If we talk about Kiev, um, again, um, we can see example of Bailey's affair. This uh, affair, ritual murder, in quotation mark, because it was never committed a ritual murder, uh, was provoked by um, Black Hundreds. Uh, Black Hundreds was a Russian nationalist organization. What really happened? Some criminals uh, killed a boy that uh, promised to denounce to them uh, in police. Uh, he was going to go to police and denounce on them. They killed the boy, and... Um, 
uh, pretend that they ritual murder. They really stab the body of boy to make it look like ritual murder. Then Black Hundred uh, made a noise and press in Kiev uh, published several Black Hundred uh, newspapers that uh, this Jews killed Christian boy. And uh, they start look for Jew and um, soon um, Menachem Bailis that live nearby the spot of murder was arrested. And um, uh, authorities support this affair because they try to prove that all Jews uh, horrible religious fanatics that commit ritual murders, uh, and um, they thought that uh, illiterate Ukrainian peasants would believe to this myth, and they intentionally, in court of jury, uh, as members of jury, uh, selected illiterate Ukrainian peasants. But even illiterate uh, Ukrainian peasants did not want to believe, at least half of them did not believe that Belis is guilty, and uh, because uh, voice split half and half, exactly half and half, Bailey was acquitted in the court and released from a court building. All this affair uh, continued for two years from 1911 to 1913, and two years innocent man was imprisoned. But it uh, showed actually that uh, uh, not all Ukrainian peasants were anti-Semites and not all of them have uh, such a horrible prejudice to believe uh, that a Jewish person just go and uh, kill the Christian children left and right. I began my uh, career as archivist in uh, uh, Kiev uh, Historical Archive and I can tell you that uh, before 1991, all documents uh, were uh, in special secret storage place, and uh, all research in Jewish history, not just Jewish history of Kiev, but all Jewish history was forbidden in the Soviet Union due to state anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union. So uh, historians before just cannot reach these documents, this, uh, uh, the plenty of documents on history of Jews in Kiev, history of Jews in Ukraine, but um, before uh, 91, it uh, was not possible to make any research on this topic. Uh, after 91, I can say uh, that archive open uh, and um, uh, several historians, even more than several, uh, travel there. Um, and I feel that uh, in future years will be published more research on history of different uh, cities, towns, and uh, different topics on history of Jews in Ukraine. I can tell you that many things surprised me. One uh, of them is um, good attitude and courageous behavior of um, some local uh, Gentile population, non-Jewish population, who with risk to their life defend Jews. For example, uh, Christian students participate in um, self-defense uh, units um, uh, that uh, protect Jews during pogroms. Uh, they were all, of course, volunteers, and, uh, nobody for them doing this. It was a, with a risk to their life because pogrom makers and troops use weapons against Jewish self-defense. Uh, and uh, sometimes perish not only Jews, but people who defend some uh, uh, Christian family hit Jews again with risk to their life because uh, at least uh, one a case documented during pogrom 1905 when a Christian person who hit Jews was killed also by pogrom makers just because he hit Jews. And uh, also um, when uh, authorities um, in uh, beginning of 20th century plan another expulsion Jews from Kiev, uh, then uh, Christian society, merchant society, sent their representative to Petersburg and asked, don't do this. The Jews are useful members of uh, merchant society. Without them, all goods uh, would disappear and uh, they necessary in Kiev. So uh, we can say that um, at least by beginning of 20th century, already appeared uh, liberal intelligentsia and other members of society 
who um, really um, believe that the Russian law unfair for Jews and who defend Jews even with the risk to their careers and the risk to their life. Another example that um, director of Kiev Polytechnic University and uh, also five deans resign in protest uh, of a percentage norm when uh, they receive order from Stalipin to expel Jews that were accepted to university above percentage norm. So uh, people can sacrifice their career for Jewish people. We can say this is a lot. Um, I uh, give a little bit of historical background. In the um, beginning of the 19th century, in Kiev already live about uh, 15,000 of Jews, but Kiev then was also a small city, about 60,000 people, so there already was uh, about a quarter of Jewish population. But Nicholas I expelled all Jews from Kiev in uh, 1835, because he exempted Kiev from pale of uh, settlement. The reason for this, uh, actually there are two reasons for this. One reason, he said that Kiev is a holy Christian city where Prince Vladimir converted uh, local population to Christianity, and it's not good that Jewish synagogues would be near uh, Christian churches, uh, so Jews should not live there. Uh, other reason that he won't uh, make a key fortress, um, uh, like Western uh, fortress uh, against Poles, uh, against uh, some other enemies, and he believes that in a um, fortress city, uh, Jews should not uh, leave, really. Uh, but next Russian Tsar, uh, who was more liberal, Alexander II, allowed uh, Jewish merchants of First Guild, Second Guild, and some uh, artisans return to city. Not for all Jews, but uh, only for selected categories of Jews. Wealthy merchants and some professions of artisans. And um, when he allowed Jews to return to Kiev by... Uh, End of the 19th century, already in Kiev, uh, live about 15% again Jewish population legally. And police complain that still thousands of Jews live illegally in Kiev. Other Jews still were not allowed to live in Kiev. However, even uh, with these uh, restrictions, limitations, uh, in Kiev, by beginning of 20th century, live 80 to 87,000 Jews. That was uh, about 15% of the uh, population of the city. Police uh, reported that there also were many illegal Jews that they expelled, that they made around na uh, up all night, but uh, they also complained that these Jews, after expulsion three days later, came back to the city. Uh, Kiev, uh, as a merchant city, was very attractive for Jews, for Jewish youth, uh, way to receive uh, better education, and, of course, much better conditions than were in towns and shtetls. Uh, I um, uh, was uh, also quite surprised how modern was uh, Kiev Jewish community in the beginning of 20th century, we can say on the eve of World War I and uh, in February Revolution 1917. Uh, Jews brought um, uh, uh, first uh, cinema theater, uh, movie theater to Kiev. Many Jews who studied abroad due to percentage norm uh, for Jewish students in Russian universities, uh, and uh, when they studied abroad, they acquired their modern European ideas regarding technology, regarding art, regarding science, basically regarding everything. And they said, uh, first movie theater established Jews in Kiev. First tram company belonged to uh, David Margolin, again, a Jewish company. Uh, uh, also hospitals, bacteriological institute, uh, polytechnical institute uh, that established Brodsky. Also, it all were innovation for the city. The Sarabsky market was first covered market, and it was very, very important to the city because before in Kiev, every few years, there were horrible epidemic diseases, including cholera, 
and uh, other diseases. And um, this happened due to unhygiene conditions uh, that were sold food, uh, sold food in Kiev. And uh, Brodsky decided that uh, they need more than covered market. He sent architect to Europe to see how built their markets. And it was uh, built from modern material at this time. It was concrete, but concrete was uh, quite new in the uh, beginning of 20th century because before everything was built from bricks. So they won't live modern life. They brought many European ideas and they definitely improve and modernize Kiev and made it comfortable, uh, modern for beginning of 20th century city. And of course, electricity, I forgot to mention electricity again. Uh, first uh, small uh, electric uh, station in Kiev that uh, basically provide uh, just for some small district uh, electricity brought Brodsky to Kiev. So basically it was uh, for his house and few other houses, but somebody should bring a small one, uh, later build a bigger one and provide electricity for the rest of the city. Yes, unfortunately, one of stereotypes, I would not say just Ukrainian population, because uh, in Kyiv, uh, uh, actually, majority of population at this time were Russian, according to statistics. Uh, why I said according to statistics? Because before revolution, many people just avoid uh, probably uh, discrimination, call themselves Russian, and they can be Poles or Ukrainians, or who knows. But at least they call themselves Russian. So one of prejudice of these people was that Jews are exploiter and they blood sucker and uh, they exploit local population. But really, if we look how much Jews contributed to Kiev, uh, you can see that Jews not work only for Jewish community; they look for uh, work for entire city. For example, a Jewish hospital uh, that was built on Jewish money and exists on money of Jewish community provide medical aid, free medical aid, uh, for uh, more Christian people than Jewish people. So everybody who needs can come there and uh, everybody receive uh, free from charge treatment. It was uh, definitely a big deal in the beginning of 20th century. Uh, also, um, if you talk about transportation, tram company, it was for entire city, not just for Jewish people. The Sarabsky Market, uh, Polytechnical Institute, Bacteriological Institute, um, and uh, so on. We can continue for a long time. All Russian exhibit uh, that uh, Brodsky donated uh, and uh, Margolin lots of money for construction pavilion of this exhibit. Uh, uh, Margolin also provide uh, his trams because exhibit uh, had a huge territory and walk over territory would take long time. But instead, they put a tram that stop in many places of this exhibits and people, especially with children, can uh, see uh, all exhibits uh, due to this transportation. So we can say that um, most what uh, really don't know people it about Jewish contribution and how much they made for Kiev. Uh, the golden period of Kiev and Jewish community is uh, beginning of 20th century. Uh, because at this time, Jews uh, finally achieve uh, permission to build synagogues in Kiev, and they have 20 synagogues and prayer houses in Kiev, and uh, they also have Jewish schools, and also um, they... Um, uh, at this time, uh, built a lot of buildings in Kiev, public buildings and uh, private, uh, very nice uh, apartment buildings. So we can say it's golden age. But uh, the paradox of this is that um, at the same time, uh, they feel continuous danger uh, and fear of pogroms. In one way, there was already 15% of Jewish population, 80 to 87,000 Jews, and um, we can say one of the largest of Jewish communities in the Russian Empire after Moscow, Petersburg, Warsaw, and Odessa, probably fifth by size. But at the same time, uh, as I said, with all this Jewish institution, with uh, also many charity organizations for poor Jews, they 
never feel completely secure in the city because they knew that basically any time can start new pogroms, a new Bailey's affair due to state anti-Semitism that exists in the Russian Empire. We don't know anything because documents don't survive from Kiev and Russia period, but first that was recorded in um, late 18th or beginning of 19th century. By documents, we don't know exactly uh, when it was built, but we know that in the beginning of 19th century already were two synagogues in Kiev, one stone synagogue and other wooden synagogue. Wooden synagogue um, actually was perished by fire, and a stone synagogue was destroyed by order of Nicholas I when Jews were expelled from Kiev. However, when Jews settled in Kiev again in the um, 1860s, uh, they asked for permission to build synagogue for 40 years, almost 40 years, and only in 1898, they received this permission. Brodsky was able to receive this permission from Petersburg authorities. Local authorities uh, did not want to allow him, but he found some connection with Petersburg authorities, probably bribed them, I don't know how. But uh, he received permission, and then Brodsky synagogue was built, uh, and it still exists and still functioned. Uh, and it, in one of illustration uh, at my uh, in my book, uh, you can see it in my book. So, uh, in addition to Brodsky synagogue, uh, later were built uh, several other synagogues in the city. And uh, by World War One, already in Kiev were twenty synagogues and prayer houses. Uh, today, uh, I know uh, three synagogues that uh, function synagogues, and uh, I'm sure that uh, there should be some still small prayer houses, but three synagogues work. One of them at Brodsky Synagogue, other synagogue in Padol district, and third is a so-called Galitsky Synagogue that, um, uh, in former Galitsky Square. All empires from uh, ancient Roman empires rule by same principle, divide and rule uh, people. So this did Russian empire and this uh, did uh, Russia today. Uh, Russian propaganda stated that um, Ukrainians uh, are horrible anti-Semites and uh, Jews uh, also um, uh, have uh, some uh, own faults and so on. But uh, if you look in practice, um, in modern day, many Jews supported um, Maidan uh, revolution and before they supported Orange Revolution and many Jews um, uh, completely patriots of Ukraine uh, in our days so uh, and uh, they totally support uh, Ukrainian authorities and the Ukrainian government and you know that today Grossman uh, uh, Jewish person is head of Ukrainian government so I don't see big problems uh, today however Anti-Semitism always exists everywhere where live Jews. Um, Einstein said that anti-Semitism is a shade of Jewish people, uh, basically a shadow of Jewish people. Where exist Jewish people, exists anti-Semitism. Uh, so um, nobody guarantee you if you travel to Russia or Ukraine or Poland uh, and you're Jewish that somebody not insult you on the street. It uh, can happen, unfortunately. Unfortunately in uh, any of uh, these uh, countries. Uh, uh, I would like to say about books that I first of all address it to Kievan Jews who descendant of Jews who live in Kiev and turn of the 20th century. And I very much want that my book will be translated and published in Ukrainian. And uh, if people hear me, uh, I would like to ask for suggestion where I can find funds for this. Because I talk to Leonid Finberg, who is a director of publishing house Duch and Litera, and director of um, Center for Study of um, History and Culture Eastern European Jews in Kiev. And he's very enthusiastic uh, to publish my book uh, if I found money for this publication. Uh, 
uh, he said that unfortunately due to economic situation in Ukraine, it's impossible to find uh, this money in Ukraine. But he said if I can find this money uh, somewhere in America or Canada, he will be more than happy to publish uh, this book in Ukraine. It's second book that cover history of Jews in Kiev. Uh, uh, first book uh, published several years ago, Nathan Mayer. Uh, that devote uh, Jewish uh, communal structures and Jewish institutions. But my book is much wider. It uh, covers culture, it covers religious life, it uh, covers political events that happen in Kiev at this time, and cover much wider period of time. His book only about second half of 19th century. My book uh, covers 10 centuries of history of Jews in Kiev. So uh, I really will be very grateful if somebody hear me and can contact me. Um, uh, please provide my mail if uh, you hear some uh, people uh, can help uh, me with this uh, to find uh, some uh, sponsor for publication of my book in Ukrainian. Because I think the largest audience for my book, uh, honestly, in Kiev, and these people uh, wait for publication of this book in Ukrainian. Today, in Kiev, live about 20,000 Jews, and uh, it's a decent-sized Jewish community, and um, there are also many, uh, not a book only for Jewish people. Many of my Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian uh, friends told me that they very interested how Jews live there, because uh, uh, their uh, ancestors told them also that they live together with Jews, that they want to know more about their Jewish neighbors. So it's a book not only for Jewish audience, but also for Ukrainian audience. Same here. Thank you very much for inviting me for this interview.